The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. This class has been taught con con uh, continuously since 19... The earliest record I have it was 1956, when Kevin Lynch probably taught it for the first time. Um, I've now, this is the 34th year in which I'm teaching the class. I overlapped with Lynch for two years. And this is the last time I'm teaching this class. Um, so I'm going to go through a lot of small things, details plus some general idea about... In 1956, Kevin Lynch called this class the visual form of the city. Between 56 and 76, he changed the title to Theory of City Form. I have kept the title as the same as it was originally well, the 1976 title. I think the theory it gives the impression that we have significant theories as in post-Darwinian science. We don't. Our basis, our epistemological basis is somewhat vague. We are somewhere between a science and an art. In the media lab, they now have a group called City Science I want to know what city science is. We certainly know what city art is. Uh, if, numer if numerical consequence is the basis of city science, we will, we will deal with that in the appropriate manner. We will also deal with very difficult things, such as the human experience of built form, which is not a scientific phenomenon at all. In fact, for those of you interested to have a background in philosophy, there's a new book called Cosmos and Mind by Thomas Nagel, a professor at New York University, who argues that Darwinian science has led us in the wrong direction, that we, Darwinian science, we can't explain concepts such as consciousness or mind, that we needed new teleological approach to science which would embrace these now difficult to achieve responses. I'm not a philosopher nor a historian. This is not a class in history, although we will use a lot of information from the past as examples to give us a better idea of the present. Not that you shouldn't know history. If you're going to take this class, I would recommend a couple of books. There is no superb urban history. If there were, Harvard or MIT would teach it. It is bizarre that these two great universities don't teach urban history. It's difficult to explain. Partly it's explained by the traditions of history in architecture. Architecture, can, you cannot study in the arts without knowing history. It's difficult to achieve a degree in music without knowing who Mozart was, but it's, part, it's very difficult to achieve a good degree in architecture without knowing who Palladio was. But you can achieve a degree in science without knowing who Copernicus was. It's difficult to avoid Copernicus, but you may be able to. There's no teaching here at MIT in the East. In the f There's no required teaching in achieving an engineering or science degree in the history of science. There's no architecture program that I know anywhere in the world that doesn't have a requirement that you study the history of architecture. Some poorly taught, of course, I assume many of you are architects by background and have done 
Have anybody done urban history? Has anybody in this class taken a formal subject in urban history? Okay, if you have, give me answer the following question. What theory would you assume for the genesis of cities? Why did cities exist? Okay. No, no, you haven't answered my question. You tell me what you studied. All right, we'll return to this question because we'll talk about the conflicting theories about the genesis of cities. When did cities first occur, time-wise? It's in the four city. I asked you, I, you give me a time. A date? About 5,000 ago, 80. Yeah, it's, it, there's no, sp I would now claim Jericho to be the oldest city, probably about 10,000 BC. But if you say it's a Sataluyuk or some place else, paleontology is very vague. Most of, most of our understanding of cities comes from archaeology. There's no theory which explains the origin of language. There are multiple theories. Uh, cities occur very late in the humanoid evolution. The first tool is dated at 2.6 million years ago in the Olduvai Gorge in Kenya found by Louis Leakey. Um, so if cities date from 10,000 years BC, we have an enormous period of time from former, 4 million years before Christ to 10,000 BC. During that period of time, a great deal of our paleontology has been ex one of the transformations of the humanoid to the human erectus deals with nutrition. Until you have a tool which can make food possible other than veget vegetables, you'll have the capacity to take in nutritional substances into the body which theoretically include the creation of a larger brain. So the brain size of Australopithecus, which is about four million years old, a post-ape animal, has a brain of about 400 cubic centimeters. You have brains of about 1,200 to 1,400 cubic centimeters, depending how big you are and how smart you are. I don't think smartness has any connection to size of brain. But I'm throwing in just one other thought here around the idea of the genesis. I'll go into this more dear carefully with you on Thursday. There's a British paleontologist, psychologist called Robin Dunbar, who studied the increase in human brain size and argues that human brains increase more significantly in communities of 150 people than when people would stayed on their own or didn't partake in rituals of 150 people. The, this theory is called the gossip theory and argues that people children need to be indoctrinated into the rules of this settlement and it takes about 150 people to make sure that these rules are properly disseminated. How this was done, nobody knows. If you believe Chomsky's theory of language acquisition, you believe that human beings have an innate capacity for language, and at a certain point, almost like the strike of a piece of lightning, it was activated in the human brain. 
There are many, many other theories. I'm not a linguist nor a philosopher, but I'm just trying to explain to you in a very primitive way how the advent of cities is late, how the advent of cities is difficult to explain. I will deal on Thursday with two contrasting theories, the theory of surplus and the theory of, cosmi of cosmic knowledge. I'm Let me go through some of the practical things that you need to know. You're going to be overwhelmed with reading. You have to not, uh, you have to develop a mature understanding of what to read and what not to read. I'm giving you an exercise. The required reading is about 1,500 pages for the semester. That's about four books. Four books for graduate student learning about cities, the form of cities, not very much. By the way, one of the reasons for the increase for the size of the reading list is the enormous expansion of material in this field. I have in front of me the 1956 references from Kevin Lynch. Uh, he totals 50 books, 51 books. Mine reading, expanded reading list is 500 books. Let me give you an example. In 1964, that's eight years after Kevin Lynch started teaching this class, the first book that dealt with third world cities or developing country cities appeared. 1964, MIT published Man's Struggle for Shelter in an Urbanizing World, a book by Charlie Abrams, still one of the best books published. Can you imagine that, it's, it's, that the literature on what now constitutes the majority of the world was not available in English until 1964? Since 60. When I first started in talking, teaching this class, students wanted to do papers on cities where they came from, Nairobi. There's no urban geography on Nairobi. Now there's an urban geography on almost every city that exists in the world. When we did a studio in Chandigarh in 19, God alone knows when, 1980s, I think. You couldn't get a plan of Chandigarh. It was prohibited by the Indian government for security reasons. The only one that you could buy was through Russian sources via Houston for $2,000. So we did the study of Chandigarh. With, we had to make our own base map. Today that would be ridiculous. So if this class has a bit of a lag, it was built at a time when there were few books and uh, material on cities was scarce. I'm not here to teach for history or for posterity. I'm here to teach you as human beings in the best way I can. But I will talk, I will cover the material as best I can in about 40 to 45 minutes. Then I will show il illustrated material in almost all the classes for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then there will be a period of 10 minutes for general observation. If we cannot, as in the case of case studies like Paris and London, finish with, there will be maybe no time for asking questions or deliberating on the subject, 
we may start the next class with me asking you questions about what you've, what questions you have about what I presented, such as why is Paris twice as dense as London? Why? Both developed significantly from 1750 onwards. Why did London develop more, less densely than Paris? You should know these things. The You're right in some ways. The wall was the last wall of the, f of the five Parisian walls was built as late as the 18... Uh, 1820s. London's, here's a rule you can, if you don't know European history, and you don't know European cities, and some of you who come from the Four Orient may not. The fortification of cities is more extreme as you go eastwards from England. The Wall of London was a pretty miserable wall. The little bits of it left in their gates, like Ludgate and so on. But basically, it wasn't very much. Vienna's walls were never penetrated, except in 1683 by the Ottoman Empire. You don't need to know all of these details, but you have to understand the conceptual structure. When do, why would you build a city? Marx, one of my favorite quotations is from Marks talking about the origin of cities. He says, The antagonism between and country, between town and country begins with the transi transition from barbarism to civilization, from tribe to state, from locality to nation, and runs through the whole history of civilization to the present day. The first antagonism he talks about is between and town and country. Cities were always clearly demarcated between town and country. It took until Renaissance Italy for nature to be introduced in the walls within the womb of the city. The Romans used to say hunc, I think hico, hunc sunt leones, they are lions. The world outside was, the walls was a a world of treachery and difficulty and fantasy. Many ideas about cities which are as complex as that idea, but the antagonism between country and city still lasts today. President Obama was elected because of the majority that he had in cities. The Demo Democratic Party is an urban party, by and large, although this has changed significantly as the size of cities has changed. And as the demarcation of polling districts has changed. Um, but we'll talk about this distinction between country and city, and uh, in the third class where I'll deal with the organic model. Uh, but you can see somebody like Marx who really tried to do everything and was right about 50% and wrong about 50%. Uh, judgment about the significance of the advent of cities. We know relatively little about these things. And I tend to prefer histories which deal with examples. So Morris's book, The History of Urban Form, or Brodel's book on the Mediterranean or on the structure of, every, of everyday life are better than, although Lewis Mumford, The Culture of Cities is still the standard. He's wrong on many things, but he's full of ideas. It's a Mumfordism to claim, anyway, forget about Mumford, we'll, 
we'll talk about him sufficiently. Um, let's see in, in these generalized notes. By the way, the other reasons why Paris is more dense than London there's not one simple reason. What kind of houses did Englishmen live in? As opposed to what kind of houses did, at, during the time of Hausmann, did the French live in? We'll go into some of those. Look, I'm not a historian, and this is, this is not a class in history. It's a class in deriving ideas from a number of sources and arguing them with you. I have no, other than a lot of time having been spent teaching and preparing for this class, and a lot of external experience practicing in cities all over the world. I have no golden formula for the truth. I don't claim to have that. I'm not sure that I believe anybody who says they do. I'm not a theist, and I'll be come across quite often as an agnostic, if not an atheist, with regard to truths of religion. Uh, as is, as Jerusalem was only been the capital of a city, of a country, twice. Once during the period of the 10th century, during the Crusader occupation, and after 1948, with the advent of Israel. Jerusalem, which we'll do in great detail in one case study, is subject to an enormous number of philosophical and interpretations of history. There is no single truth about Jerusalem that is outside the truth of geopolitics at the moment. This is true for much of... So, if I to use the term theory, which Kevin Lynch started, um, I will use the term, I would have not called this class theory of city form. We live in a predominantly scientific age in which theory is theory in physics, and it's as, about as precise and, uh, uh, a, a, as, as it can be. Theory in the social sciences is much looser and theory in city form is even looser than that. So I would have called it, this class, really more preoccupied with normative ideas, normative and functional ideas about the form of cities, rather than theory. If I taught this class in Paris, I would be deriving theory from theory. This class is, follows the Chicago style, and I only will discuss a theory if I can uh, attribute an example in association with it. So I will be making propositions and choosing an example to adumbrate that proposition. The example will come from architecture very much. Amongst these social sciences or disciplines other than urbanism, if there is such a thing as the discipline of urbanism. Much of my material will come from the built world. It's a bias which I accept, and it's the only one that I know a little bit about. Um, so, for instance, if I want to talk about the problem of how you deal with the future expansion of a city, I will look at the plans of 
university buildings designed in competition uh, from 1955 and 1960 to 1990, where an attempt to design for a system which could take accept change is much easier to see. I'll also refer to a thesis done here on MIT, which looks at the way MIT has been able to expand using the same trajectory of expansion, formal expansion. What else? As for the definition of a city, I'm going to use any definition that you wish to bring forward. Cities are by and large denser than non-cities, uh, and that's about all you can say. It's the, the SMSA definition of the metropolitan area is useful for statistical purposes, but God alone knows what Mexico City, what are the boundaries of Mexico City? There's more investment outside of the city of Mexico City in the metropolitan area than there is in the city itself. Uh, is Foxborough, Foxborough, where the Patriots play football every Sunday during the winter, part of the metropolitan area of Boston. Certainly the city of Boston had nothing to do with the decision to locate it in Foxborough. As cities have expanded horizontally, so the issue of what the boundary of a city is becomes more complex and more interesting. There are more new prototypes of urbanism created by the expansion or horizontal expansions and more anger by architects who believe that cities should still be framed as if they were walled. Both of these arguments are pretty viable. Uh, and worth will be worth discussing them. Okay, I'm going on and on and on. Any questions from about procedure? You're all very silent. Has there, has anything I've said uh, been wrong? That's amazing. You're much too gullible. <laughs> um, Look, I will at times say things which I feel more strongly than I feel about other things. That's my privilege because I teach this class. If you were ta taught the class, you would have that privilege. You are absolutely free to question everything I say. Let me just say something which I hope you'll remember. In one of the evaluations of this class, which is done every year, there was a question from the students as to why they didn't ask more questions. And one of the number of answers is, the professor knows too much. My response is, would you prefer to be taught by a professor who knows too little? That's a stupid response. Please just don't feel because I have had 34 years of experience teaching this class that you should understand it all without question. I feel free to diverge and choose opportunities to say things which come to me for the first time. That's the way I think. I would like you to think in the same way, even if the you might get irritated by my presumption. There is no single theory of city form that exists. There's no absolute theory. There are many theories. And there are preferred theories as opposed to city theories. There are many, many problems. The Robert Dunbar's theory about 150 people 
has been taken up and firms, corporate firms, have divided the manpower into groups of 150 people based on Dunbar's studies. We're not going to do something as silly as that. Reading those two pieces by Kevin Lynch in the, generated in this class through discussion. And uh, I think they ask questions which are interesting and answers which are interesting. The first three classes, starting on Thursday, deal, well, let me generalize first. There are three major sections in this class. Section one deals with the nature of city form theory and goes on till the fourth, goes on till the sixth class. The first six classes deal with examples and ideas about the form of cities. Um, the three analogical examples, the first one which I'll deal with on Thursday, posits a metaphysical relationship between the form of the city and the cosmos. This will deal with all of the material from paleontologists and philosophers like Mercia Eliade, who will argue that there's a that in that uh, the archaic cities had connections to celestial systems. We want to ask why. What, what are the implications of survival in terms of practical methods of dealing with survival in the form of the city as opposed to metaphysical? Why is the temple of Marduk, the city god of, Mesa, of Babylon, on top of the Tower of Babel? Estimates of the Tower of Babel are about 300 feet in brick and stone. You can't build much taller than that, although the pyramids of Giza are about 300 meters, I think. Why place a temple on top of a tower? We will ask questions of this kind. We will ask why this one of the earlier, and you can help us here, one of the earlier cities of dynastic China has a pattern which resembles the star system of the Dipper. Um, essentially, Lynch, Mumford, Adams are amongst the major protagonists of the cosmic theory of, early, of archaic city form. By this theory, it means that we know where cities should be located. We have techniques for finding the place where it should be best built. It has a relationship with survival. It has ritual systems. One of the things I will do is I will give you a piece of series of pieces of paper every class. So for instance, instead of me having to make a list of all of the reasons for why the cosmic for what the cosmic form can do, I will hand it out to you on a sheet of paper. This is a gift. You would have 26 gifts at the end of the semester to add to your m numerous amounts of paper. Um, I will often show a diagram which I can't show in slide form uh, to help us manipulate the class. I will tell you. I will sometimes try to bring the class up to date by giving you a piece from the New York Times that day. The New York Times will come up in some of, some of these. One of the problems with teaching a class for 34 years is that you get bored. Most of you who graduate from MIT with advanced degrees teach. I don't know how you teach the calculus for 34 years without going around the bend. <laughs> so what I try to do is to teach the class differently every time I teach it. So I will start off taking a piece from this morning's paper 
on Hurricane Sandy and what Mayor Bloomberg proposes to do and tie it into the theory that we're examining that day. And I will give you that piece of paper or those sheets of paper, sometimes three, sometimes I'll give you a series of plans which will take five pages. For instance, when we talk about the Grand Paris competition, I will give you excerpts from the, comp from the competition. So I'll give you paper. You can throw it away. You can use it during the class. It's an adjunct. You can give me gifts in return. Don't take that seriously. <laughs> the second of the analogical propositions we look at will be the, the machine model. These three models were derived in this class with Kevin Lynch a number of years ago. And I've adapted them for this and modernized them. The machine model deals with everything from the first grid city to the laws of the Indies, to contemporary attempts at machine interpretation. The fourth class looks with a tradition of regarding the city as a function of nature and looks to organic analogies. We will look at a number of theorists of this kind, Patrick Geddes, Ebenezer Howard, and so on. But I will be skeptical about this. I'm skeptical about biomorphism. Uh, uh, and I will say I'm skeptical. I will go through very briefly with you the history from 1933 of the greatest planning effort in this country, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, I will show you how in 19, 1933, I will tell you about Roosevelt's theoretical understanding of nature. I will talk to you about the southern urbanist re re reaction to that, viewing nature in a completely different way. I will talk to you about Henry Ford's proposition to build Muscle Shoals as an industrial agricultural city instead of the new Henry Ford proposed to the United States Congress to buy the first dam for, for $1 million. And the Senator Norris, great man, turned it down. Instead, we'll go on to new images of nature. In the, we'll talk about the establishment of the controversy about the f small fish in one of the dams. We'll go on to the fact that the 28 dams are now, the 28 dams that are built no longer provide uh, sufficient hydroelectric energy, and 60% of the industry supported by electricity comes from coal. The worst coal disaster, the worst environmental disaster in history took place in the Tennessee Valley Authority. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to say, Nature is not a fixed commodity. Yeah, in one project, I, there are annual protests against the, where did the Manhattan Project, where was the Manhattan Project? Was in the Tennessee Valley Authority. There are anti-nuclear protests every year. Nature is a difficult subject. Forget about nature. You're a human being, you have an animal, you have a brain many, many times the size of any other living creature. Your decisions are not bad ones. At least that's my point of view. I'm a humanist, forgive me. I'm not a naturalist. We debate that proposition. I then will spend two classes looking at theoretical propositions. One largely from the social sciences, economics, political science, history, and so on. And then I will look at four attempts to 
create reasonable theory, uh, Lynch, Martin, uh, Alexander, Bracken, and Hillier uh, as examples. We will stop there with the introduction. That is a large introduction to the class. I'll start section two with the first early cities of capitalism. Nothing that preceded human in human history, as far as urbanization is concerned, is as important as what happened from 1750 onwards. I will try to convince you not to ignore urban history. It's not taught anyway. Um, but to really concentrate on the period from 1750 onwards. The greatest event in human history is the Industrial Revolution. Why it took place in England? Why it took place in the first place? We will look at a number of theories which explain that, including uh, a recent theoretical exp exploration by a man from California called Clark, his book A Farewell to Arms, is an interesting biogenetic attempt to explain the change in human behavior in the, in the, uh, in the 19th century in England. In 18, 1850, in London was the largest city in the world. It was the first city in the world since Rome to have achieved a million population more or less. We don't measure these things very accurately. At the same time, the first rules were introduced into boxing. Why? Medieval boxing was de dealt with cruelty to animals. They, I would read you a little story about the burning of a cat in front of royalty and the population in Paris in the 18th century. Boxing in a medieval sporting event was, didn't separate big giants from small men. Women didn't box. Cockfighting, Hemingway says that bullfighting is the last vestigial sport. What he's saying is that the transformation from free-ranging animal-human interaction in medieval sport changed dramatically with industrialization. The 1855, the Marcus of Queensbury rules in boxing limited the length of boxing rounds to two minutes, I think, or five minutes, whatever it is. That's when Manchester United was formed. So we look at sport as an analogy to culture in relation to, we'll deal with Marx, no, not Marx, Marx, yes, we always deal with Marx. You can't avoid him. Um, we'll deal with Engels' period in Manchester and his book, The Condition of the Working Class in England. We'll deal with a number of things when we do the case study of London. We'll deal with a number of economic and social transformation, I, which I consider fundamental to consider to any consideration of the modern city. The first is the invention of the mortgage system. None of you know anything about the mortgage system. Nobody knows very much. Do you realize that one of the great causes for the American Depression was that you couldn't engage in a domestic mortgage to borrow money for bu buying a house? That was invented as part of the feudal system in Manchester and Birmingham in the 1830s onwards. I'll talk about the conquest of cholera in London and the building and the... London in 1850 with a million people was the most filthy city in, the, in world history. 
there were a number of people who made livings just scavenging the dirt in the London, in the Thames, digging up old bodies, old waste. Cholera was considered to be an as uh, disease through the air. A wonderful doctor, there's this great book which I refer to in the reading. Um, the Ghost Map is the book which goes into detail about how this man discovered that cholera was a waterborne disease, which led to the greatest public building works in the history of London, the, the redistribution of water from the north and the south into bypasses which took the, takes the polluted water horizontally away from the center of London. Um, We'll do the same with Paris. Here I will deal with another fundamental innovation, and that's deficit spending. You cannot do major works in a city without borrowing money. The great conflict amongst the prefects of the Seine until Haussmann about building as much as the purse would allow, which was very little. Haussmann benefited from the great work of Saint-Simon and other economists, which showed that if you borrowed money, you could pay it back at enormous benefit. Haussmann borrowed enough money in the 20 years between 1850 and 1870 to rebuild Paris. That loan, those loans were only repaid in 1928. Deficit spending has become, you can, if you're interested, we can talk about deficit spending, national deficit spending. The great trauma economically in the United States politics, politics is an extension of deficit spending. Most of the Democrats believe that a large deficit isn't a fundamental flaw in the economic system. The Republicans, by and large, have the opposite position. They believe that a national economy is much like a buying, per, developing a mortgage. You can't have too large a mortgage as opposed to how much grow, economic growth you have. We will touch on this economic distinction and I'll refer you to reading a book by the Nobel Prize winner, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, who talks about the, the fundamental problem of disparity, large disparities of income as measured by the Gini coefficient uh, and economic growth. But this comes, starts in Paris. In the years, in the 20-year period from 1850 to 1870. Now, architects look at Hartsman and say, he built avenues. If you don't like avenues, you say he's a horrible man. If you like avenues, you think he was a saint. He did lots of other things than build avenues. He built the avenues according to an economic relationship with the banks which allowed him to borrow enormous amounts of money. So we'll move on from the case studies of Paris and London, which are classic. I should hurry up. To looking at one of the conventional 19th century responses to the first cities of capitalism, and that's Barcelona. We look at the genius of Edifonso Serdar's plan for Barcelona, the largest housing plan in Europe. Uh, a number of issues. Uh, how do, I presume some of you have been to Barcelona and know the Ensange. Almost every theorist from Barcelona, including my friend Morales, who died last year, 
uh, claims there's something significant in the Assange. I want to know what you think. Has any been to, who's been to Barcelona? You all better go before the class. There are a number of intriguing things about the competition which Serta won against uh, a modern proposition for modular growth as opposed to the neoclassical proposition who the man who he defeated. Um, we look at we look we'll we we'll look at uh, at Edifonso Sardar in a way which very few people tend to look at him, and that's part of a neo-Marxist Marxian notion of what urbanism should be. We look at uh, a man from Paris who came to this country, the new Icarian system. Anyway, we'll look at Vienna again as the reuse of infrastructure. Vienna is interesting for a number of ways, in part, not only the building of the Ringstrasse, but for the two, uh, but for the 1683 attempt by the Ottoman Empire to take Vienna. Vienna was within one morning of being taken over by the Ottomans. The Ottomans succeeded in defeating Christianity in 1453 by using a German cannon, which took, had to be schlepped across Europe to, to, Otto, to Istanbul by 30 oxen over there to build bridges wherever they had to cross a waterway when they got it, brought it to Istanbul, he destroyed the Christian double wall and moat by sending rocks 100 meters of, 100, 1,300 meters away. The attempt to defeat Moscow, at least Vienna, after crossing all the way from Istanbul uh, is very well documented in a very good book. But the savior of Vienna for Christianity by the intervention of the King of Poland's cavalry is one of these extraordinary events in history which, had it not happened, Vienna would have been an, uh, an Islam, Islamic city. And Europe's future would have been without Sigmund Freud, Beethoven, Mozart, etc., etc. Now that may have been better for Europe. I'm not arguing that I know, but it's one of the cardinal. It's in connection with the wall because the uh, Islamic engineers went dug under the earth and built a tunnel under the southern wall into the center. So walls didn't pay off altogether. After these case studies, well, the last of the case studies will be Chicago. Chicago has no aristocracy, only a middle class, an immigrant population, and is one of the few great 19th century cities. Which other cities were developed in the 19th century? Can you name me one? Did Hmm? San Francisco. Yeah, it's a bit dubious about what its uh, origins are, but you were maybe right. Johannesburg is certainly one. Uh, Chicago is unusual in really only having been developed from 1830 onwards. Uh, Chicago is also unbelievably interesting in relation to the role of the private, private sector in the development of a city. The European examples really deal with government. Uh, the private sector in Chicago built an illegal underground subway system without the city knowing it. Now, if you have a city which can, has enough hubris to allow a private subway system to be built, um, it also deals with the Chicago World's Fair and the various 
episodes leading to it. We'll spend some time going through the Chicago World's Fair and we'll contrast it with The Devil in the White City, the book which many of you probably know, uh, and the incredible loss of lack of public governance in a city which was so being developed by the private sector. Uh, the little section two will end with two classes, one on utopianism, which I dislike as an idea, but we'll do the class anyway. You may enjoy it more than I do. Uh, but the interesting, we'll realize the link between Engels and the Mormon and the Shakers. Do you realize that the woman who started the Shaker movement come from Manchester? And, and after having, I think, a fifth stillborn baby, she reviled against sex left the United States and came to start the Shaker utopian movement in this country. There's a relationship between the evils of capitalism, pre-hygiene, and the utopian movement. Utopianism has many interesting followers. And then we'll do a brief look at some 20th century realizations. In England, the British town planning movement after 1946, and uh, the, uh, the socialist city in Russia. Look, all of these are enormous topics, and I'm just going to select a couple of ideas and go with those ideas. This is an enormous attic of stuff. <coughs> this class is over fat and tries to do too much. It's the accumulation of 34 years of not doing, being on a diet. So you have lots of the fragments of stuff. The last, the last half of the class deals with current theory and practice. The first section deals with the question, is there a relationship or what is the relationship between the way a city is made and its form. The second group deal with what is the relationship between social structure and spatial structure. <coughs> and here we do case studies of Jerusalem, Johannesburg, the Latin, uh, the border between Mexico and the United States, and uh, colonial Delhi in India. That takes us to the third week of April, and it's spring already, I hope, and we can keep these windows open for the sun to come in. I deal with a number of propositions, formal propositions. Number 24 models one, sorry, number two, 19, four models, one deals with modern and postmodern urbanism, deals with the origin of modernism and mainly the CIM discourse on urbanism uh, and uh, some reactions to it. Number 20 deals with the proposition about the city as an opportunity for building in an open-ended fashion questions of prophecy, questions of imagining the future, questions of finding formal structures which can accommodate change with a minimum cost uh, are part of this. I would look at the British research done at the Cambridge University Land Form and Built, Built Form and Land Use Studies Group, Leslie Martin, uh, Fawcett, weeks. I would look at the opposite notion in the work in the theories of Leon Creer and Aldo Rossi, two European theorists, uh, which those of you will know from architecture. Um, um, 
postulating that it is the past that he should govern any preoccupation with the form of a city. Rossi has a theories, a theories of, of monumentality which we need to examine. Creer has some, you know, unintellig some intelligent but really remarkably stupid notions about uh, classicism and the, the, the revival of classicism and that cities were great during classical times and uh, we have this is the derivation from neoclassicism which we need to look at carefully we ne need to look we need to take a careful look at the way in which we derive notions from history the next class deals with m with memory Memory and history are two different things in urbanism. Uh, I will try to explain that through the attempt to it all of us have for maintaining continuity. We'll deal with the work of the writing of uh, uh, Maurice Halfwachs, the book of collective memory, uh, and other examples of the conflict between history and memory. Pierre Noir is writing about the French, about the loss of living memory through history, that history derived, dis displaces living memory and so on. But the, no the fact that we now have more stuff in cities than ever before and a building less and less and reusing more and more material uh, argues for a look at memory. The last few classes deal with the public difference between the contemporary difference between the public and private domain, um, the relationship between the external, the extra muros and the muros, the ex, the suburbs and the central city in the United States. We'll, the last few classes will take a brief look at splintering urbanism, the effect of modern virtual communication systems on the form of the predicted form of cities. Um, uh, take a brief look at the effect of issues of cli climate change and sustainability. And the last day of class, I will deal with a major uh, issue of the GNI coefficient and poverty. If there's, in my view, one issue which urbanism is doing less about than any other and is in theoretically seemingly incapable of doing that, that is reducing the level of poverty in the non-European, non-American world. That's an animal, a nasty animal which we bypass as we do any serious attempt at universal climate change theory. It's what I think the nasty future holds for us. And then we'll end with that rather dismal proposition. On the other hand, I'd at the same time be talking about the wonderful successes that we've achieved over 10,000 years. Oh, we a little more than 10,000 years, but 10,000 of human history. Just to be able to teach this class with all of this stuff, whether it's a good class or bad class, is only due to the fact that we've accumulated enough experience have had enough human minds thinking about urbanism for this period of time. It's a major, major achievement. 
Marx is right, without cities there'd be no civilization. And without civilization we wouldn't be sitting here today. But the two gaps which Mar one of which of course Marx and Engels made a living of was picking up on the notion of the inability to deal with the, the unnatural distinction between wealth and poverty and what that means in the latest attempts by groups such as Slum Dwellers International. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the exhibition at the United Nations last year or the year before, uh, produced by the Cooper Hewitt Museum on third world cities. Okay, so you don't know. What else? Is that enough for one semester? <laughs> We're going to go quickly, and I'm not going to be able to explain second order, third order issues. This is an open-ended system. It's got infinite dimensions. We're going to look at the core dimensions. And if they lead us outward, great. Maybe you'll have a universal theory of urbanism by the end of this class. I haven't got one. <coughs> Any questions? You're all very silent. If you find a piece of reading in the in this class schedule, you will find the reference in the thicker bibliography I've given you. If it's up to date and I hope it is. I check it every year and try to keep it up to date. But if you have any trouble with a book or a reference, just send me an email. I like the email system because it allows me to do things in my own time. But if you need to talk, let's talk. It's an open invitation. We're all very busy people. Um, so, for instance, when I mentioned Halbwach and the, the, his book, The Collective Memory, it's not, I will quote a bit from it in the class, but it's not, I purposely didn't put it as required reading because you'd have to read the whole book. I couldn't, one of the, uh, there's a part of me which had an upbringing that I had to read whole books. You couldn't read a piece of Shakespeare. We were beaten over our heads. We've got five minutes. We were beaten over our heads uh, if we came in and read only a piece of Henry V, a famous speech. Um, I am understanding of the amount of energy and time it takes to read. Uh, so I've tried to give the required readings as parts of books. There's not one whole book that I've referred to. In the case of Halvachs, it's very difficult to extract a chapter. There's a wonderful chapter on memory in music which fascinates me. I mean, whenever I hear somebody conducting Mahler's Ninth Symphony without a score, I'm amazed at how it is humanly possible to understand such complex music and direct it for two hours, an hour and 40 minutes perhaps. He tries to explain that individual memory is impossible, that a social memory is what creates individual memory. It's a, he was a collectivist sociologist and uh, wrote some brilliant things about memory. But uh, there's a case, if, if you read the book, it'll be worth reading. Uh, maybe I'll excite you about the book. Okay, I'll see you next Thursday if you continue. If you don't, good luck with the rest of your life. <laughs>